Hello, I'm Sandy Sugard. I work with the North Carolina Community College System. And with me here today is Professor Herb Gross, who's known across the country as one of the great community college teachers. He's a mathematics professor from Bunker Hill Community College and internationally known as a mathematics educator. Also with me today is Susan Brown, who's an education consultant and the executive producer of TeachNet, a radio program dedicated to discussion of important education issues. We're gathered here today for uh, an extended discussion of a major problem facing education in our society called math anxiety. Uh, for many years, education leaders, as well as uh, folks in industry and government, have been concerned about the low level of math achievement uh, among our citizenry. Uh, it's even more important now, perhaps, than ever with the workforce preparedness issues that we face today. Uh, most of our efforts over the past 20 years have met, frankly, with very little success. Until a couple of years ago, at least in my experience, when we began a special project uh, led by uh, Professor Gross uh, at the Harnett Correctional Unit with a group of students that any teacher might be a little intimidated by, a medium security prison unit in Central North Carolina served by Central Carolina Community College. And uh, recently, Susan visited that uh, implementation site to look at the project and saw some pretty surprising things, I think. Susie, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, when I had a chance to interview Herb on the radio program, he was so enthusiastic about what was going on at the prison that I thought, well, I listened to a lot of educational issues, and I encouraged people to get involved, so I decided to go down to Harnett and see what was going on, because it was so hard to believe that your enthusiasm could match a program. It was too enthusiastic. So I went down, and I expected, I don't know what I expected, to see, you know, inmates lounging, you know, having sips of water, not paying attention. What was there was a relaxed, calm atmosphere, and learning was taking place. And the learning was in the subject of math. What I didn't see was any math anxiety. And we hear a lot about this. People are terrified of mathematics. They will not advance in their jobs because of a lack of understanding of math. It's all lumped together under math anxiety. You'd expect to see it in a prison where inmates have probably dropped out of school, have not been in an educational system for a long time, but at Harnett, where they're working with your program, Herb, I didn't see any evidence of math anxiety. Right, right. There probably wasn't any to begin with. <clears throat> probably what you saw, or what was really expected to see, is what I prefer to call math frustration. You see, it's very easy to find covering words for things. For example, there is such a thing as burnout, but not everybody who hates their job has burnout. There is such a thing as dyslexia, but not everybody who's dyslectic. Uh, not everybody who can't read is dyslectic, see. And there is such a thing as math anxiety, but most people who are bad at math don't have math anxiety. In fact, historically, math anxiety was a very, very selective term. It was applied only to very, very bright people who had trouble with math for no apparent reason. And you see, what we were seeing at the prison, I think, is a very, very interesting thing. Most people who have math frustration have it either because sometime early in their career, they were on chapter three of the textbook when the teacher was already talking on chapter six. And they fell far behind and they got frustrated. And one frustration led to another and pretty soon they were petrified of the subject. And in that sense, it wasn't anxiety, it was fear, frustration, okay. Now one of the things that we do in our project at Hanna is all my lectures are on videotape. So it becomes a self-paced course. It's impossible to be behind in a self-paced course. If the student's on chapter three, and I'm talking to somebody else on chapter six, that student can still look at the lecture on chapter three, then get to chapter four, and there's still a live teacher around to ask questions. So you begin to see that lack of frustration replaced by self-esteem, by confidence, when the person says, hey, the only thing that was wrong with me is I was too slow before. See, I could learn it if I had more time. But the more amazing thing that surprised me was how the inmates, and I think that speaking about inmates now, that's just a control group. I mean, any student would have the same reaction. They were amazed when they found out how much of mathematical difficulty was due to language. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of a cartoon that I saw many, many years ago. And it's funny how in life a strange thing can get you started. I saw a cartoon that made me think. It was a funny cartoon. It's a, it's a cartoon. It's, it takes place during the flood. Noah's, it's, it's in the time of Noah. And it's pouring rain. And there's miles and miles of animals in pairs waiting to get onto the ark. At the very end of the line are two zebras. And one zebra says to the other zebra, Don, Noah, and his stupid alphabetical order. 
Okay? <laughs> now, that's a funny story, isn't it? The amazing thing about that story is suppose you wanted to translate that cartoon into a foreign language. Did you ever stop to realize that, what, that that cartoon has nothing to do with the animal zebra? It has to do with the word zebra. Mm -hmm. For example, in a different language, if the, if the animal zebra began with a different letter of the alphabet, say near the beginning of the alphabet, that wouldn't be a funny cartoon. And that's what made me start to think about the fact that we talk about concepts, but we see words. Almost a language is an artificial language. I mean, it's an artificial construction. It's man-made. And basically, lots of times when you have trouble learning something, it may be because of the language, not because of the concept. I only know one sentence in Spanish. Uh, my daughter taught it to me so I could make this illustration. In fact, I did a series of videotapes at, at MIT called Calculus Revisited, which have been shown all over the world. But they were dubbed into Spanish for use in, some, in South America. And so now on my resume, I can now write, I speak Spanish fluently, but just on videotape. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but let me give you an example. Uh, I say to, there's, there's, let's say there's a black <coughs> cat in the room. So I give a true-false test to somebody. I say, the cat is black. And you have to answer truthfully. The cat is black. There's a black cat in the room. The person says, true. Now I say to the same person, true or false? El gato es negro. And the person, that happens to be Spanish for the cat is black. But the person doesn't know Spanish. Well, you can't say true, you can't say false. You see, to be able to say true or false requires that you understand what the thing says. So all you can say is, I don't know. Now, why else might a person have said, I don't know? Certainly because uh, he doesn't know the language. But is it possible he knew Spanish and still would say, I don't know? Hmm. Only if he didn't know what a cat was. Or unless he was colorblind. Colorblind. Hmm. Colorblind. Sure. If he was colorblind, he would say, I don't know. But colorblindness is bilingual. If you're colorblind in Spanish, you're certainly colorblind in English. Hmm. You right. see, once the person said, the cat is black is true, but al gato es negro is I don't know. He couldn't be colorblind. It had to be a language problem. See, and my claim is that many people who have trouble with math don't have a math barrier. They have a language barrier that we could almost call, they don't have number blindness. They have a number barrier. Okay? And, and I think it's important before we start with this thing to point out a couple of things. And uh, w one is that uh, I'm going to take an approach. R rather than to talk about 15 different possible causes of math anxiety, the success at Harnett is so great that I want to zero in just on the language part. And to do this properly, I want people to get the idea that even without talking about math, language is a very, very important thing. Mm -hmm. it, I remember this happening for the first time to me in about the fifth grade. And I didn't see it as a great story at the time. I just saw it as a riddle. Do you remember things like this? What word becomes shorter when you add letters onto it? I remember that. You remember, that? Yeah, remember what it was? Short. The word short. Yeah. You see, you add on the letters ER, the word short becomes shorter. In other words, th the word shorter is actually longer than the word short. There's another one I like to show people. It's, it's like rearrange the letters in new door to form, to form one word. See, rearrange mm. the letters in new door to form one word. And if you've seen the trick before, it's not funny. If you haven't seen it, you just get frustrated. So let's look at the answer. If you rearrange the letters of new door to form one word, that's exactly what you get, one word. See? In other words, one word is two words. See, and things like that happen. Now, the same thing happens mathematically. If I said to a person, half of eight is three, we say, my God, he's no better in math than I am. But look, look at what happens that way. See, here's an eight. Half of it is three. We're not saying half of the number eight is three. We're saying what? Half of the numeral, the symbol that stands for eight, looks for this, like the symbol that stands for three. And by the way, as strange as this looks, that's exactly what the Romans did with Roman numerals. Do you remember the Romans used an X for 10? Mm -hmm. Well, what's half of 10? Five, right? What's half of x? V. V. Now, of course, this is also half. This is half. This is half. But the Romans were very frugal. Since this half looked like a letter of the alphabet, they just, they just took that on. See, uh, one last one that I'd like to show you is, 
this one, I, I, I did a seminar for third graders, and to show you how fast they caught on, one kid raised his hand and says, I know one that shows that four plus five is 10. I'd never seen that one before. And what he showed me was this. He said, I'll start with four, and he wrote down four tally marks. He says, now I'll add on five more tally marks. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> ah, that's good. Okay, do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You see the difference between the concept of 10 and the word that denotes 10? So it's a very, very important thing. Now, you, you may say something like, well, what's that really got to do with learning mathematics? See, and my claim is that everything you've seen in math basically is a language thing. You, you know, nobody has ever seen a number, for example. Well, as, uh, uh, to make this really awkward, now you have to understand English. You've seen numbers as adjectives, not as nouns. Like if I say three, you might think of three fingers, three apples, three people, but you don't usually think of threeness by itself. Now, again, if I'm a young kid and somebody says, how much is this many and this many, I just say it's this many, right? right. Notice how much more complicated it is to write three plus two equals five, which is a complete sentence in the language of mathematics. By the way, it's a universal language. You see, in, uh, in English we say two, the Russians say dva, German says zwei, but they all read this the same way. But here's a complete grammatically correct sentence without a single word in it. And see, we have youngsters that learn to count on their fingers very, very, very early in life. You say to a little kid, how much is 89 plus four? He starts with 89, holds up four fingers and counts 90, 91, 92, 93. Now, if you had written down for that youngster, 89 plus 4, 4 and 9 are 13, put down the 3 and carry the 1, I mean, that's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. And yet, what do we do in school very <coughs> often? We say to the kids, big children don't count on their fingers. See, and what's wrong with counting on your fingers? What you're saying is that using your fingers to count is a way of using a vocabulary that's already familiar to you. That's right. And yeah. see, it's a form of relevance. It's a form of relevance. See, the fingers are relevant to the kid. They make sense to the kid. See, whether it's math or anything else, one thing that characterizes society is that we seek the simplest solution to any problem that plagues us. And we look for a more complicated solution only when the simpler one ceases to be a solution or else it becomes too cumbersome. Mm -hmm. Don't ever say to a kid, you can't count on your fingers. Obviously, he just did it. But he needs to have some other system when it, the, the mathematical problem is more complicated than ten fingers. That's the point. See, don't tell him he can't count on his fingers. Did you notice when you were at the prison the dignity that the inmates had? How good they felt about themselves? When you talked to the inmates, did you find them talking positively about the program? Not only that, they boasted about the they program. They boasted about they it. They were so proud of themselves, they ruffled their feathers. It was wonderful to see. It wasn't wonderful to see? And, and, and how... I, I w there was almost an anger at how many years they had been frustrated in math to find out it wasn't really their fault at all. And one of the reasons that it's not their fault is that one of the jobs of a master teacher is to make the material relevant to the needs of the student. When a student says to me, I don't have to know the addition tables for 89 plus 4. I can count on my fingers. Don't tell him you can't do that. Just say to him, oh, great. How much is 523 plus 136? Now, unless, God forbid, it's a birth defect baby or something like this, you're not going to be able to do this problem on your fingers. That's, see, have this kid look at the 423 and try to visualize the 136. Now, the student says, I don't have enough fingers. And now you say, well, we're ready to make a big jump in society. Are we going to say that you can only do math problems if you have enough fingers? Or are we going to have to find an innovative way of doing things? Now, for example, you know, it's, it's a very kind of interesting thing. You'll hear a teacher sometimes say, it's as simple as two and two is four, or it's as simple as three and two is five. You know, that's a very, very complicated concept. I think I've done this with Susan before, but just for the fun of it. If I wrote down three plus two is 40, would you think I was a good mathematician or a bad mathematician? Bad. Bad, yeah. right? Bad mathematician. Uh, then I said, oh, I'm sorry, I get so excited seeing you folks here that I didn't write down the whole problem. What I meant to say was three dimes plus two nickels is 40 cents. So you didn't have matching nouns. Yeah. In other words, what's interesting is that when you take this little statement that we wrote down before, that three plus two is five, that's a profound statement. Do you know what that says? It says 
that three and two are five whenever three, two, and five are adjectives modifying the same noun. Mm -hmm. If they're not modifying the same noun, all bets are off. Mm -hmm. And in fact, do you notice what you did here? You found a common denomination. You said that three dimes was 30 cents, and two nickels was 10 cents. Now, since the 30 and the 10 are modifying the same noun, we can add them and keep the common denomination. And I don't want to scare anybody this early into the program, but we just did fractions. Notice that the, that, that the word denomination uh -huh. sounds like denominator? Mm -hmm. And what about that word numerator? It's kind of funny, isn't it? It sounds like it means something other than top. I mean, wouldn't you say an educated person should use the simplest word that gets the job done, not the hardest? Sure. See, if top and numerator meant the same thing, shouldn't you just say the top? Sure. But they don't mean the same thing. For example, Christian Dior never invented the numeratorless bathing suit. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you're going to use the big word, make sure there's a reason for it so the student understands it. Right. See, numerate so numerator sounds like enumerate. Enumerate means to count. To count answers the question of how many. How many is an adjective. Denominator sounds like denomination. That's the size. That's a noun. You need a common denomination before you add. Now, let me show you something strange about that. If I teach a kid that 3 plus 2 is 5, whenever 3, 2, and 5 modify the same noun, that's teaching them what? That 3 apples plus 2 apples is 5 apples, right? Right. I can put any noun in here I want. I mean, for example, I say, how much is 3? I'll make up a word here. Glugs. I don't know. Glugs? <laughs> Who cares? I say, how much is three glugs and two glugs? Kids say, I don't know what a glug is. I say, neither do I. But three of them and two more of them must be what? Five. Five of them. Heck, that's simple. Now watch what happens. I want to just show you the number problem here. Suppose I now say to a kid who's never heard the word billion, how much is three billion plus two billion? And he'll say five billion. He'll say five billion because he, he doesn't have to know what the word billion means. He has three of them plus two more. That's five billion. Now, remember we talked about number blindness and the like? Look, the problem is in the language of place value, when you put down this three over here, how do you show the person that the three is modifying billions? You see, three is always this number, one, two, three, no matter what it modifies. But three what? Like a person is walking down the street with me and says, what's that over there? I say, oh, that's a yellow. <laughs> a yellow what? Yeah. See, I have to show the person that this means what? Three billion. Now, how do I do that in place value? I have to say there are no millions, no thousands, and no units. And two billion now looks like this. Now look at the psychological problem here. Psychologically, if you're afraid of math, does the bottom problem look tougher than the top problem? Absolutely. Sure it does. Sure it does. And if you say the top one is easy, but the bottom one is hard, you don't have a math problem. You're not number blind. You have a language problem. You have to be taught that the price you pay for getting rid of the word billion is you have to put in nine zeros. Well, now let's go back to that problem that I was dealing with before. I'll, I'll go back to the same one, because just in case somebody was paying attention, we should go back <laughs> to it. We, we, we put down 3, 423 plus 136. Okay. Right? Well, what, the, what is this an abbreviation for? It stands, see, look at There are hundreds, right? Tens and ones, aren't there? And 423 means what? Four hundreds, two tens, and three ones. 136 means 100, three tens, and six ones. Now, when is six plus three nine? When they modify the same, the noun. same noun. Now, even if you didn't know the word ones, are the six and the three in the same column? Numbers in the same column modify the same noun. See, three in the first column plus six in the first column is? Nine in nine the first, in the first column. column. See, can we say, okay, sure, nine in the first column. Two in the tens column plus three in the tens column, and if you don't like that word, two in the second column plus three in the second column is five. Mm -hmm. And one in the hundreds place and four in the hundreds place is five in the hundreds place. And now without counting on our fingers, though actually we did, we, ca we could count on our fingers for the hundreds place, we can count on our fingers in the tens place, and count on the fingers in the ones place, in one fell swoop, we have added 423 plus 136 to get 559 in a way that extends what was natural for the kid to do in the first place. He's still counting on his fingers. Mm -hmm. But you see what's happened? How long would it have taken if you didn't notice this particular thing? See, just to jump ahead a little bit too, uh, when you're learning multiplication, why do kids have trouble with the eight table, for example? 
because they're counting on their fingers, see? They'll say, let's see, 8 times 2, that means 8 plus 8. Well, they say 8 and 8 more, my God, it's 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Then you say, okay, what's 8 times 3? They say, my God, 16, 17, 18. When you want to make change for a ten, suppose, suppose you pay for something that costs eight dollars. Do you usually give the guy eight ones, or do you usually give him a ten and he gives you two dollars change? Mm -hmm. Kids have seen that before, so why not teach them? Hey, to add on eight, add on ten, that would give you twenty-six. Take away two ones, that leaves you with twenty-four. The average kid grasps that because he doesn't realize that's the same thing as adding eight on. So what's he going to do next? He says, wow, that was easy, but it was too easy. I'd probably get a different answer if I did it the long way. And now they're doing the same drill that wasn't fun before. Why? Because they're involved now. They see where it's coming from. It's made relevant to them. Sure. Yeah. sure. And they're having fun testing to see if sure. the teacher's right. Sure. Now, of course, you know, the next thing people like to say to me is, yeah, I, I knew whole numbers before. It's them fractions that give me trouble. Right. That's, that's true in applied math as well as in the math classes. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about that? If you understand whole numbers, you understand fractions. For, you show me a number that's seven times as big as another number, and mm -hmm. I'll show you a number that's one-seventh as big mm -hmm. as another number. You know, it's, it, for, and I think, uh, I don't want to get into fractions right away, but let's just do something over here. Suppose you're a foreign language, English is a second language student, and the teacher has taught you the sentence, John is taller than Bill. And the teacher says, rewrite this so that Bill's name comes before John's, okay? Now, just because you know the word taller, do you automatically know the word shorter or do you have to learn that? You have to learn that. See, yeah. conceptually, if John is taller than Bill, I know in my language that Bill is shorter than John. But I don't know, see, when I write the word Bill is something than John, the one thing I'm sure of is that the word taller isn't going to go in here. I kind of want to make up the word untaller. See, untaller, like necessary, unnecessary, even, mm -hmm. uneven. But it, just, it happens that untaller isn't the word. The word happens to be shorter. So that even though I knew the concept, I didn't know the vocabulary automatically. Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that you're comfortable with whole numbers, but you're not comfortable with fractions. So I say to you, true or false, one week is seven days. And they say, oh my God, I don't know fractions. No, no fractions, fractions here. I say, okay, now I want you to paraphrase this so that the word wake and day, week and day, are interchanged. See, one day is blank weeks. You follow this? Mm -hmm. See, just like this taller and shorter. Now you know that if it takes seven days to make a week, one day must be one of the seven that makes up a week. But what you may not know is that the symbol for that is one seventh, one over seven. And when you say seven days, that means to multiply a day by seven. When you say one seventh of a week, it means to divide the week by seven. See, in other words, a seven in front of a noun means to multiply by seven. A one seventh in front of a noun means to divide by seven. That's all it means. But the language throws you off over here. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, Susan, we mentioned that one of the things that the inmates enjoyed at the prison was they could learn at their own pace. Suppose somebody watching this program right now says, wow, uh, that's an interesting thing, but I need time to think about it. If this were a traditional classroom, while he's thinking about it, I'm going on and adding two fractions, like one-seventh plus one-ninth or something like that. He's still saying, what the heck is one-seventh? What's going to be nice about this is we're going to be ending this program, you know, in, in this particular phase. We, we have, remember, four half-hour tapes of a continuous conversation, but we're deliberately stopping every so often not just to make convenient time blocks, but to have the viewer realize that if there's something you want to review before you go on to the next segment, you just stop the tape and go on. In other words, didn't one of the inmates tell you that one of the nice things about having me on tape was they could eject me whenever they wanted? <laughs> that was funny. That's what they said. They said, you know, with Herb Gross on tape, we can shut him up. Yeah. When he's not on tape, we can't. But the thing that they were, they were interested in was what? Now they can go back and say, let's see, taller is to shorter as seven is to one-seventh. They can practice that way. And by the way, you know, when you talk that way, you go up to a little kid and say, you're the big brother, he's the little brother, why don't you keep two-thirds of the candy and give him one-third? That kid doesn't know what you're talking about, but he's polite, and he waits for you to leave. And as soon as you leave, he wants to make sure you're not there anymore. He says, I'm going to divide the candy up my way. And what does he say? 
Two for me, one Two for, for you. me, <laughs> one for you. Two for me, one for you. And what's interesting over here is he's taking what? Two and one is three. I'm taking two out of every three. And I never hear a fraction there. Yeah. See, so when I work with youngsters in the fourth grade, by the time I get through with them, when I say four sevenths, they're thinking four out of every seven. That means if I take four out of seven, that leaves three. So that means four for me, three for you. Right. See? But, they, but what throws them off is the four over the seven, and that in turn is nothing compared to the phrase four sevenths, which they haven't heard. But every one of them understands four for me, three for you. So their problem isn't numbers. It isn't math anxiety. It's, it's a language. language. It's a language. And we need to get a bilingual I in think math. So. That bilingual in math, that's mm -hmm. exactly it. Okay. I think that's exactly what it boils down to. And, I, and, and again, you, know, you have to understand, uh, it, uh, it's different strokes for different folks. You know, in closing this segment, if everybody in the audience would just fold their hands and see which way their thumbs go. See, my left thumb goes over my right thumb. So does mine. So does mine. Sandy's Sorry, y'all right do it wrong. Y'all do it wrong. <laughs> see, yeah. Now, here's the interesting part. Do it the opposite way. Doesn't feel as comfortable, does no, it? No. See, what's comfortable <laughs> for you may not be comfortable for somebody else. And the danger we make as a teacher or as anything in life is when we say, this is the right way to fold your hands because I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. See, so I'm comfortable with the language idea. And if people are comfortable with the language idea and want to follow me through the rest of the segments this way, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think this is probably a good place to stop. Yeah. Thank you.